This video is going to be a general introduction to the concept of chemical equilibrium. Recall from last year that we made four assumptions about chemical reactions. We said they would have to be spontaneous, fast, quantitative, and stoichiometric. And this was especially in the context of doing chemical analyses. So let's just make sure we remember what each of them means. Of course, spontaneous means that the reaction happens when you mix the things together. Fast means you don't have to wait too long. It happens within a short period of time. Quantitative basically means that it goes to completion, that all the reactants turn into products. And stoichiometric means it happens in the mole ratio of our balanced chemical equation. We've already challenged some of these concepts this year. Remember when we talked about activation energy and the reaction coordinate? We said a reaction like this could go in either direction. It could be headed up the hump or it could uh, be headed sort of down the hump. Well, we figured out then already that not all reactions are spontaneous, especially the reverse direction is not going to be spontaneous. And if the activation energy is too high, it's not going to be spontaneous. We also talked about reactions that weren't fast enough and we needed to add a catalyst to them. So we know that not all of these assumptions are true. Today, especially, we're going to be challenging this third one about reactions being quantitative. So do all the reactants turn into products, or at least is the limiting reagent completely used up? And what we're going to see is that, no, it's not always the case that the limiting reagent is always used up. And that's where the term equilibrium comes in. There's an equilibrium established, but there may be some reactants and some products both present in that equilibrium state. Let's start with sort of imagining that we were going to do this reaction. We're going to mix some calcium chloride with some sodium sulfate, and it's going to produce calcium sulfate, and if you look that up on your solubility chart, it's a solid with some aqueous salt. And let's make the calcium chloride the limiting re reagent. So imagine we do the calculation, we know we have excess of sodium sulfate, and we dump these two things together. What happens? Well, we for sure see a solid forming, we see a precipitate, but now we want to test the remaining solution to see what's left. Because of course our prediction would be that our limiting reagent was completely used up. Well, in fact, if we add some sodium carbonate, it ends up actually reacting with calcium chloride to produce a solid left over. We get some calcium carbonate precipitating as a solid. And we know it's calcium carbonate because nothing else here could possibly react with that to form a precipitate. Right, obviously the sodium carbonate is an aqueous solution. And the only other thing it could have joined up with was more sodium, but that's obviously still aqueous. So this carbonate joined up with calcium, but we thought there wasn't any calcium left. So from doing this experiment, we learned that not all of the limiting reagent is actually used up. So that means that while this reaction did occur and we did produce some calcium sulfate, it was not complete, it was not quantitative. So what was established instead was an equilibrium. We can replace our arrow with a double-headed arrow saying this reaction could actually go both ways and there might be some of both uh, or some of any of the reagents left as we could call them products or reactants or whatever you want to call them then. I want you to recall the definition of dynamic equilibrium. Remember it was the balance between two opposite processes occurring at the same rate. And you may have heard this before in terms of, for example, crystallization and dissolving. So if you have a saturated solution that there's crystallization happening and there's dissolving happening at the same rate, but what we establish in a chemical reaction like this, which, doesn't, uh, which is not quantitative, is also a dynamic equilibrium. There's the forward reaction and the reverse reaction happening at the same rate, at the same time. So once it's in a state of equilibrium, we don't see any changes in what's there, but both processes are happening at the same time, opposite directions. And that's why we draw the double-headed arrow, to show that this reaction could be going forward or reverse, and in fact, it's doing both at the same time, at the same rate. Let's just take a quick little example to illustrate dynamic equilibrium. I'm going to suppose I have two towns. Let's call this town A, and this over here is going to be town B. Now, suppose there's a divided highway joining these two towns. So this highway moves in this direction, 
This highway moves in this direction. Let's say town A has a population of 500 people. Town B has a population of 300 people. Now what happens when we open up that highway and people are allowed to drive between these two towns? Well, we get some people moving from town A over to town B and vice versa. Now if we assume that these two processes are happening at the same rate, that there's just as many people going the one direction as the other direction, we will not be able to see any change in the population and the number of people in each town. If 100 people move one way and 100 people move the other way, population stays the same. If we would fill a crop duster up with spray paint and go spray paint all of town A red so all the cars in town A are red and all the cars in town B are purple, what would happen then? Well, over time, we would see some of the red cars, well, they ended up driving over to town B, and some of the purple cars ended up driving over to town A, but the number, the total number of cars in both towns is still the same. And this illustrates an important chemical concept. We say that when there's an equilibrium established, there, uh, there may be microscopic changes. And this is like zooming in and seeing, oh, there's a, there's a town of, I mean, there's a car of red in town B, which is the purple town. So there is some molecules that used to be in, on the one side that are now on the other side, so to speak. But there are no macroscopic changes. And macroscopic is things that you can view from more of a distance. And in, in this example, that would be the population. The population stays the same. No macroscopic changes. There are microscopic changes. And that's one way to tell if something is in a dynamic equilibrium. So let me grab the same chemical equation again just to use for some more illustrations. What is going to affect a dynamic equilibrium? And uh, let's also change to a double-headed arrow here as well. So what is going to change whether this equilibrium leans more towards the reactants or leans more towards the product? Well, what is going to cause reactants to form products? The cause of that is always successful collisions. And you can think back to kinetic molecular theory for this. But if there's more successful collisions between calcium chloride and sodium sulfate, it's going to form more product. If there's more successful collisions between calcium sulfate and sodium chloride, it's going to go the other way and form more reactants again. Successful collisions is really a probability. So if we can somehow change the probability of a successful collision on the reactant side, then we make this edge more towards the products. If we can change and there ends up being more successful collisions on the product side, it will lean more towards reactants because they will form the reactants again. So just to quickly think about what would increase the chance of having a successful collision, well, if you have more of something, so if you increase the concentration, that's one way of having more chance of a collision happening. If you increase the temperature, then a collision is more likely to be successful because it's more likely to have sufficient energy to actually uh, do the reaction. Now, of course, temperature is something that's going to affect both sides. It's going to make more successful collisions between the reactants, but also between the products, but not necessarily the same effect on both. It might have more of an effect on reactants, for example, because maybe they're both in aqueous solution and one of the products is a solid or something like that. So while we might not necessarily know the difference, yet we know that changing the temperature will probably affect the equilibrium and whether our reaction leans more towards reactants or products. But especially changing the concentration. If you would imagine dumping more calcium chloride in here, well, right away that's going to mean more collisions between calcium chloride and sodium sulfate, so then it's going to go lean heavier towards the products because of that increase in concentration. But the same thing could be said if you would dump more of the products in. So if you would dump more sodium chloride in, you would cause the reaction to go more the other way. So just remember that uh, reactions are not always quantitative. Sometimes they establish an equilibrium and there will be reactants and products present. How many of each we don't know yet at this point, but we know that there are factors that will affect whether a reaction leans more toward reactants or towards products.